So greetings, uh, everybody in Girl Scout land. I am here with Sarah Anderson, who is a uh, staff member at uh, Yosemite National Park. She's also worked at uh, some other national parks, and uh, she is a former Girl Scout. And she is going to walk us through uh, some of uh, her experiences, um, both uh, extra, like uh, apart from um, being a staff person at the National Parks, but also um, what uh, experiences she has had uh, kind of uh, on her own recreationally. Um, and this is, um, I think you'll, you're really going to enjoy uh, some of the experiences that she shares. Um, they play uh, or mesh very well with um, some of the things that you can learn when you take a look at the Girl Scouts citizen scientist programs. Um, as you probably know, about two years ago, Girl Scouts of USA released a series of um, badge books. And so Sarah, I think we'll have um, some um, insights on uh, what uh, it takes to be a citizen scientist in terms of honing your powers of observation and what you can see in nature. So uh, Sarah, I thought I'd, I'd start with asking you um, what you remember about being a Girl Scout. Yeah, um, so I was a Girl Scout uh, up through fourth grade. I was a brownie, and then I think the next level is junior. A few things um, that I remember are just the camaraderie. Um, it was really nice to have a group of friends that were interested in learning new things um, and, tr and trying different things. Um, and uh, I also remember a couple activities that uh, stuck out in my mind. Um, one of my favorites was uh, going to a camp in the winter time. Uh, all of us uh, going to this um, camp that's usually a summer camp and um, never having done that before, never having uh, camped in the winter before. And we weren't in tents. We actually stayed in a caboose. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was just a really neat experience. I remember um, you know, going outside and it was snowing and just being able to explore with my friends was a really, really great experience for me. Um, and then the other thing that I remember um, pretty vividly, and I'm not exactly sure why, maybe just because I'm sort of into DIY and crafting and all that, but I remember we went to um, the recycling center once uh, just to sort of see how our waste is processed and how we're a part of that. And we made recycled paper. <laughs> um, and that was something that was really new for me. And, uh, and it, yeah, it was just fun to sort of have different opportunities to try for the very first time. That is very cool. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to fast forward ahead of some of my questions just a bit, because I know um, at Yosemite, you've been under um, a red flag warning. And um, I think that's really uh, increased uh, a lot of folks' awareness of the importance of things like recycle, repurpose, reuse. Um, what's it been like being under that red flag warning? Oh, uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a really challenging about week and a half, um, because we've actually had a fire quite close, uh, to, um, to our house and to the park and it's really massive. Um, so it, it's nerve wracking, um, to know that that's so close and that we might be asked to leave, um, to make sure that we're all safe. Um, and the other challenging thing right now is that, of course, you know, we have COVID going on. And, and the one thing that I think a lot of people can do is get outdoors, get some good exercise, go on a walk. Um, and that's been the one thing that people can really enjoy. Um, we can't go outside right now. It's the smoke is just um, making that really tough to do. It, it starts to, you know, kind of give you a headache and um, it's not super pleasant. So it's challenging, um, you know, both right now and just knowing in general um, that this is a problem out here. And it's something that um, in California, we're starting to see, you know, having to deal with it a lot more every year. Um, it's something that I think as a country, we're going to start having to deal with more all, you know, together collectively and also as a global community. Um, we're seeing that, you know, kind of... Uh, an aggregate of effects here. 
um, both with our, our drought and the time of year and lightning strikes and you know other ignition sources, but we're also seeing the impacts of climate change um, that is, is really uh, influencing what's going on here. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to be something that we're just, it's not going anywhere. This is going to be something that we'll continue to have to deal with. And so that's emotionally a little bit difficult to deal with too. Um, but it's also good motivation, right? To do our part and to, um, try to figure out together how to come up with solutions for, for this sort of thing. Yeah. So I want to do a little aside here. Um, Ladies, uh, young ladies out there, if you're looking for a take action project, uh, this might be something you want to look at. <laughs> so, <laughs> please, uh, <laughs> I want to go outside. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, can you tell uh, our audience at home here um, what uh, you know? Um, give us a little background on your work uh, with the national park system. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, worked at three different parks and um, I've done a lot of other things too, but uh, working in a natural surrounding, uh, working with the public, working to help educate is something that I've always really wanted to do. And so this has kind of been a long-term dream is to make a career with the park service. Um, and so I worked at three parks. The first was a really small one in Nevada called Great Basin. And I had no idea what I was in for. Um, I just got the call saying, would you like to come work for six months? Um, because there's a lot of jobs out there that are seasonal, um, so short term. So I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And um, absolutely loved it. I had such a great time out there. Um, had never been to that part of the country, um, had never, you know, <laughs> spent time in a desert and um, I, I really, really enjoyed working there. Um, I went back to a non park service job out in Washington for a little while. And then another opportunity came up with the park service. And that was oddly enough on Alcatraz Island, which not a lot of people might expect as a park, <laughs> um, but it is part of a larger park uh, in the San Francisco Bay area called the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Um, and so I worked there for about three years um, and then uh, got an opportunity to come and work out here where I am now at Yosemite in California. And um, I've been here for a little bit over a year now. The first two jobs that I had, uh, by the way, were um, park ranger jobs. So I was working with the public and doing programming and uh, educating them about history and wildlife and plants and resources, that sort of thing. Um, and now my job is a little bit on the back end. Um, so I'm kind of uh, in a support role where I am helping people get paid and um, helping you know, to get people hired, things like that. So I work for the Roads and Trails crew now here at Yosemite. Um, and uh, for anybody who uh, might not recognize this, I have to point out my virtual background is part of Yosemite. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, like Sarah, feel at home here. Um, so, you are standing um, right now on the swinging bridge. <laughs> oh, here. I hope I can support my weight. <laughs> it actually doesn't swing anymore, so you're fine. <laughs> You'll just go right through. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, so um, what uh, first sparked your interest in the national parks? So it was kind of um, a culmination of, of different things. I, I guess um, I didn't have from, you know, a very, very young age, a ton of exposure to the parks. It came a, a little bit later. Um, and um, I, I remember going on a trip with my folks out west. Uh, we hit up some national parks. Um, when we went out west and just being totally blown away by how much different different parts of the country looked and what sorts of resources uh, were out there and 
Um, I just, uh, I thought that was very, very cool. It's like, oh, every place has something different to offer. And I thought that was really neat. Um, but leading up to that, I got my sort of initial start or I was, you know, most interested in nature um, at a very local level. Um, so it started out smaller than that. Um, still my favorite place in the world is my local nature center back home in Michigan. Um, it's just, I, I go there every time I'm back home. Uh, it's really, really special to me. And um, that's kind of how I got my start uh, and my interest in the outdoors um, is just by checking out what was around me. Um, that interest grew, I became, you know, uh, more involved in different outdoor activities. Um, and uh, so I think that leading up to that, I, I initially had just an interest in the outdoors. Um, Part of the reason that I thought it would be cool to do something like what I'm doing now as far as a career is concerned is um, I had the chance to get interested in the outdoors, had a chance to see different national park sites and say that's really cool. And then I also um, saw, I, I attended a, a tour um, with, with a guide. This wasn't at a national park site. Um, this was on a, a vacation with my family. but we attended a tour that the guy was so just excited and ready to go and show us everything. And you could tell, you know, he was just so happy we were there and, and wanted to give us the entire history um, of the space that we were at. And I was very inspired by that. I was inspired by this, this guy's enthusiasm. And I thought, oh, that'd be really cool, you know, to be able to help people connect to these spaces and know that they're there and understand them and um, know what they can do there and what's cool about this place. So it was a couple different things um, that I think led me down this path. Uh, I think, uh, and you're probably aware of this, that there's a whole bunch of research that um, verifies the, um, the real benefits that come from being outdoors, things like um, being able to problem solve better, think more creatively, it's calming, it uh, reduces that sense of anxiety. And um, it's, it's very, um, I think, uh, cool to hear that, um, you know, all those experiences just, I, th I think that sort of um, points in that direction that, that uh, increased your curiosity, but also um, sounds like it's like it, it's given you this sense of centeredness. Yeah, definitely. I would say that um, the outdoors uh, play a huge part of my life and, and also kind of who, who I am and how I interact with the world. Um, it, it, it is a very healing space and I encourage everybody, you know, to just get out as much as possible. And whether that's, you know, on a small scale, like a local nature center, or just taking a walk somewhere um, or going to a national park and making it a goal to see those um, or a state park or state forest, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think if you just get out and sort of like, you know, take in the smells, take in the sights, look around you, observe your environment. Um, it makes you, uh, in my opinion, feel much more connected uh, to, uh, to, I guess, uh, the universe. <laughs> am I getting to, uh, <laughs> am, I, am I going down oh, a weird no, path here? <laughs> perfect sense to me, but <laughs> yeah, but that's because we're both girls. Uh, <laughs> I have to ask you, you are wearing a uniform, aren't you? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was like, uh, I, I thought that was actually part of your park ranger. Uh. Actually, it's it's funny because um, I I put this on just because I I like this top. And what I've come to realize is that not on purpose, I dress like a park ranger on my off days. I'm like, I have way too much green. <laughs> So but I can show you my you uniform. You never have too much green. <laughs> yeah, let me go grab my uniform and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay. Um, there's a couple different variations depending on uh, the season, but this is a basic uniform that I would probably wear in the winter time, at least out here in California. I might need a few layers, more layers in Michigan. <laughs> but um, you've got uh, green pants with this embroidered belt and um, you can see that there are sequoia cones uh, embroidered on that. Um, 
And then this is uh, basically, uh, you can see a sweater, um, a shirt underneath. Um, and then <laughs> it's funny, you, can, you have two choices of ties as a female. And uh, we call this one the brownie tie, and that's the one I like. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've got a tie, uh, and then you've got a, a badge that shows that you're a park ranger, so people can identify you easily and ask you questions and interact with you and, and know that you're there to help them. Uh, and then I've got my name badge, so people know what to call me. <laughs> and then um, you can see uh, this is the um, park service arrowhead. So that is sort of another identifying feature uh, of working for the park service. This is sort of like our logo. Um, and then of course, a lot of people can identify us by the hat. <laughs> <laughs> we do wear the hat. <laughs> um, so this is a Stetson. Uh, and um, this is usually, this type of hat is usually worn when you're doing a program with the public. Um, so I would wear this um, on my tours around Alcatraz. Um, in Nevada, I was giving cave tours. So I would wear this at that time when I was um, having interactions with visitors. If I'm just out and about or doing work or getting dirty, something like that, <laughs> um, we also have a ball cap. So there's a couple different variations, but um, most people are familiar with that flat hat. It's kind of a, an iconic look. <laughs> Very fashionable. Right? <laughs> Actually, um, yeah, we've got a couple of them. That one is a, a felt hat, and we also have a straw hat. So we have all different kinds of lines, summer and fall lines, and you name it. <laughs> Much like Girl Scout uniforms. Right. But, uh, so, so now I know you've had a lot of different opportunities to look at the natural world pretty close up and personal and um, from a lot of different perspectives. And can you tell us what the, um, what's the most surprising thing or the most interesting thing that you might uh, have uh, learned from those observations? Um, a couple things, a couple takeaways for me. Um, the first is um, just to be observant. <laughs> um, you, I guess when you get out in nature and really pay attention and really listen and really watch um, and really smell and use your senses, um, you pick up on a lot of things that usually kind of blend into the background noise. Um, so that's, that's, I think, a really important tool when you're out in nature and, and can help you appreciate some, some things on a smaller scale. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, from utilizing that skill uh, that I have found, I guess maybe to be the most surprising is um, I've definitely been able to see what the differences are from the different places that I've been to and what makes each place special and unique. But I've also been really surprised by how much overlap there is. Um, I got really excited just a week ago from seeing a particular type of flower that I remember in Nevada. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was just out on a walk around my house and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I, I remember talking about this with visitors. Um, I remember talking about this flower and what it can be used for, and that's really neat. And I had no idea that it was out here. And um, when I see, you know, plants or animals, things like that uh, out here that I recognize from Michigan, I get really excited. And I'm like, oh, I had no idea that was out here too. <laughs> um, and so I think that's, uh, first of all, kind of interesting and exciting because it helps you um, to kind of connect the dots in uh, what links places together, but it also helps you to make then some hypotheses about that. Okay, well, if this part of the environment is the same, what does that mean? Um, you know, if we have the same uh, flowers growing here, but they look different in this way, or they're larger, or they, you know, are smaller, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by utilizing um, those skills, I think you can sort of draw some conclusions, and it's pretty exciting uh, to be able to do that. Um, and it can, uh, I think, really blend with what you were mentioning, it, Chris, with uh, the um, citizen science stuff uh, in just uh, looking what's around you and using your own frame of reference um, to, to connect the dots. 
Um, and I do know that uh, the National Park Service has had, and I, the Monarch Butterfly is one of the things that comes to mind, because that's a project that's been going on for a number of years. And some of the things as far as uh, observing the butterflies in the milkweed, um, I mean, I know around here, um, my um, neighbor has very deliberately planted milkweed and I have seen over the past maybe three to five years since I've been here significant increases in the number of monarchs that we've seen around. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, I, I know also that you just completed the Muir Trail, and uh, I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about what that was like, and um, you know, just to maybe for people who might not be super familiar with that. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so uh, I just did. Um, I just backpacked with a friend of mine uh, about 93 miles. Um, we were doing about 10 to 13 miles a day. Um, and uh, the entire trail, uh, which goes through the Sierra Nevada mountains, is a little bit over 200 miles. Um, I think like 213. Um, so the John Muir Trail is basically a, a trail out here in California um, for people who want to go on a nice long walk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there's a couple other sort of 50 pounds on their back. <laughs> right. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's a couple uh, trails across the United States that I would classify as more like mega trails. Um, and that's one of them. There's the John Muir Trail, there's the Pacific Crest Trail, there's the Appalachian Trail. And there's one that I, in Colorado that I am forgetting the name to right now, but um, basically they're just uh, continuous stretches of trail that you can go on a longer trip on. Um, so what you do is uh, you um, plan your route, you plan how many miles you want to walk each day, um, you get uh, all of your gear ready to go because you're carrying everything with you. Um, in a backpack from sleeping supplies to food supplies, first aid, um, all of your clothes, things like that. Um, so you, it's quite a bit of preparation, um, but you get all that ready to go. And then um, you walk however many miles uh, you've chosen to walk each day and you camp out at night. Um, if you want to see some of the gear that I took, I did get some of that together. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I, I understand too, you, you, uh, and you, I think you had some some photos, uh, maybe both from the Muir Trail and from uh, some of your other experiences. So yeah, we'd like oh, to yeah. see all of that. Actually, yeah, you'd be able to see the gear in that too. Okay. <laughs> so, whatever, um, good yeah, I can show you some photos. Um, let me see if I can figure out screen share. <laughs> so these are not in order per se, but... Um, <laughs> They are uh, some different photos from along our route. Uh, we started south and we're hiking north. Um, this is close to the end of our trip. And the reason I wanted to share it is because this is where my citizen science skills came into play. <laughs> um, <laughs> this uh, field that you're looking at is called Red's Meadow. And uh, I'm not sure what happened, but all of the trees were sort of uh, like you can see kind of chopped off mid trunk. And I'm not sure if it was a canopy fire or another natural event, but all the trees looked like that. It was really bizarre. And from a distance, I was thinking, oh, that's not going to be super pretty or enjoyable to walk through. All the trees are, you know, beheaded. Um, <laughs> and um, we got down there and I was really shocked at how lovely it was. Um, this, these purple flowers are called lupine. And it was just this incredible understory of lupine and other plants that were allowed to grow without that um, shadowy overstory. And because of that, and because um, of the fact that the trunks remained, this was the most incredible bird habitat. And you could just see all these birds flying around. And, um, and you had to look for them uh, and you know, kind of use those observational skills. Uh, but they were all around us. And they just were having a great time out in this field. <laughs> um, it makes you know, super bird habitat. So. Um, that really struck me. I thought, wow, that's really cool. You know, from 
you know, from first glance, it doesn't look like the nicest place to be. It looks like there's something wrong with it, like it's damaged. But then when we got into the field, I was like, actually, this is an amazing ecosystem out here. Um, these are some friends. <laughs> Um, so the, um, I'm all the way on, I'm, I'm the one in the hat, I guess. Uh, I don't know if it's showing the same on your screen, but on the left, <laughs> um, my friend is the one in the middle. And then, uh, the lady on the right is another, um, trail hiker that we met. Cause there's just this, like with Girl Scouts, there's this really cool camaraderie with backpackers, um, because they're all kind of doing the same thing and, uh, have the same interests and are, experiencing the same physical pain that you are. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to know people out there, which is really fun. This is um, kind of at the beginning of the trail. Uh, and um, you can see there's a, a lake in the forefront and there's some mountains. This is um, what a lot of the John Muir Trail is, is a lot of um, kind of large mountain passes, a lot of really beautiful alpine lakes. Um, this particular mountain was kind of interesting because you can see that it's red. And this is from, again, if you use those observational skills, okay, why is it red? And then you see some of the rocks on the ground and they've got little holes in them. Okay, why are we seeing pumice is an old volcano. Um, so uh, that was pretty neat. We saw a couple uh, features like that and realized, oh, this was, you know, some time ago, a vol pretty volcanically active area. I am fording a river here. <laughs> uh, I like this picture because I look like the boy from Up. <laughs> um, this is one of the mountain passes that we walked through. Uh, we were not with them, but I thought this was really cool. Uh, we saw a couple mule trains uh, delivering supplies to backcountry crews. So I work for Roads and Trails now, and um, I know that a lot of... Uh, mule trains like this will go out and deliver supplies and things like that. And so I always get really excited when I see them on the trail. Um, so I took a picture of their, their stream crossing. Um, sorry if this is a gross picture. <laughs> this is every morning. Um, so part of backpacking is uh, rising to the challenge, pushing yourself. I've got issues with my feet and this was part of it. I knew that, you know, I was going to be walking a lot every day. So this was, this is part of the trip. <laughs> it's not all glamorous. Um, this is a hoary marmot. I love them. I think they're so cute. It's like a big fur pancake. <laughs> and you see them sunning themselves on the rocks. Uh, I took a picture here because um, when you're out backpacking, you have to filter your water. Um, and it's kind of an arduous thing to do. Um, you don't always, when you get to camp, want to go and find a spot to filter water because you're tired and you just want to hang out and be done for the day. But um, one thing that I really like about backpacking is that you just sort of have to embrace the tough parts too. And it can be really rewarding. Like we said, okay, we got to go get water. But then we found this amazing stream and just hung out there and dipped our feet in and it was really lovely. Um, so this is one of our water stops. Uh, this is Evolution Lake, uh, which was one of my favorite lakes while we were out there. It was just very cool. And you can see this is early in the morning, so the sun's just starting to come up, and it's just really lovely. This is a terrible picture, but it's the first time I saw a pika. <laughs> so that kind of gray blob <laughs> in the middle is a pika, uh, which sort of looks like a, the cross between a guinea pig and a mouse and they squeak. <laughs> so I was really excited to see that for the first time. Oops, where am I going? <laughs> uh, some more mountains, some more lakes and mountains. Uh, this is where we started Devil's Post Pile, um, which is actually a, a, a monument that's really easy to get to. So you don't even need to uh, hike 93 miles to see this. <laughs> Um, this is, was right at the start, um, and it's a really cool area. This is also formed by volcanic activity. Loved these flowers. Um, they're, I think, called tiger lilies, um, and there were a lot of them blooming out on the trail, so that was really nice. Um, 
this is not a planet on Star Wars. <laughs> this is, even though it looks like it, this is um, a cabin that was built uh, in the 30s, I believe, um, at the same time that the trail was being constructed. And uh, it was basically a project uh, started by the Sierra Club. Um, and they thought, let's make this long stretch of trail that people who really want to get deep into the wilderness and you know, hang out here for a while can do. Um, and as part of the construction, they constructed this cabin on one of the uh, high points. So on, on one of the passes. Um, and they realized, oh, when you're up this high at a lot of times of the year that you might come out here, this is a really great place for storms. <laughs> and we <laughs> ran into a lot of storms. Um, they're really common this type of, this time of year. And so basically they built this little shelter for people to take refuge in. And it was really neat inside. It had a fireplace and um, everything you could want to sort of hunker down until the storm passes. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. It's still COVID out there. So <laughs> when we did run into people, uh, we had our masks with us. <laughs> And that's the, the end of the trail. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I feel all the excitement without having to, had done any, any of the work. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now nobody has to do it again. <laughs> oh, and this is uh, well, a shot actually of one do of our hope that some people will consider that at some point. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> it looks very beautiful and really like a, a unique experience not something you can necessarily get in every uh, state in the union so yeah um it, it definitely was really uh really special um yeah. and i think that you know there's so many spaces that you can get out to and explore and enjoy um and they're not always right at the start of the trail. Sometimes they are, um, and sometimes they're not. And that's one thing that I like about backpacking is um, it gives you a chance to go a little bit further uh, and um, spend a little bit more time out there and really kind of acclimate to a different pace. Um, and the other thing that I, I love about it is you feel strong. <laughs> um, it's really hard. You saw a picture of my feet. Um, there's a lot of really... There's a lot of aspects other than that that are also not glamorous. <laughs> um, but by the time you're done, by the time you push your body, and by the time, you know, you kind of go through that and realize I can do this and I can rise to the challenge, you come out of the woods just feeling like, man, I'm really strong and I can do things that I didn't think that I could do. Um, <clears throat> so that's, I think those are some of my favorite things about, uh, about going backpacking. Um, it does strike me because a lot of what you're talking about in terms of, I mean, you obviously talked about being curious and observing things and being in nature, but the whole notion of being strong and setting a goal and um, moving forward and how do I accomplish this goal, that's so much of what we want girls to learn in Girl Scouting. So, um, you know, as a former Girl Scout, it's like I feel like... Uh, Wow, you're just a, a great example of that for uh, you know our young lady. Look, at she remembers. <laughs> so, so I'm really glad that uh, you know you were able to take some time with us to share all of um, your observations and some of the um, wonderful pictures from the Muir Trail. Um, anything you would like to add for our, our viewing audience? Um. Gosh, I don't think so. I guess I would just, um, if there's one takeaway, um, I guess I would, I would want to say, I didn't start out backpacking. <laughs> backpacking is really intense and there's a lot of sort of skills that I picked up that led me to that um, hobby. And uh, I'm really glad that I had some friends who were involved in it, who encouraged me to do it and, and try something very new and very challenging um, and get into it. Um, but that's not where I started. And I think it's just important to, whatever your benchmarks are to push yourself, um, to just sort of you know keep 
keep meeting those and keep looking for those because they're really opportunities. Um, you know, I wouldn't have gotten here if I hadn't gone and first explored my nature center back home. Um, and there's a lot of places. And, and where was that again? Because I know it's still in our, our council's footprint. So in Midland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Midland, Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would just encourage you really to get out to outdoor spaces and think of, you know, how you can interact with them and, um, and sort of look for different opportunities and also just take some time to use it as a healing space, especially right now and have some quiet moments and um, yeah, kind of look for the, the small things that are really uh, sort of a treat for, for getting outside, you know, the sounds and smells and things like that. That is, I think, uh, a great uh, place to leave uh, our, our audience with the, those thoughts. So um, thank you so much for taking your time today. And um, we're keeping our fingers crossed for you that uh, you uh, that those uh, um, red flag warnings can be uh, lifted soon and things uh, may go back to some semblance of normalcy. Yeah, well, I, like I appreciate that. And um, yeah. yeah, we're we're hoping for that too. And um, yeah, thanks for having me today. And I mean, this is stuff that I think is really cool and interesting. Okay. So hopefully somebody out there, uh, you know, will, will have some kind of takeaway from this too. So yeah, I appreciate being here. All right, great. Thanks. Sure. Bye. Well, <laughs>